So here we are for part two of the, um, our coverage of the Traxler counterattack. And in the first part, we examined after these early moves, e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, knight f6, knight g5, and bishop c5, which, is, which marks the beginning of the Traxler, we examined uh, the craziness that ensued after the move knight takes f7, which looks like the most natural and best move. But as it turns out, um, black, if he knows what he's doing, has at least a draw in those uh, lines. Uh, instead, what I recommend if you're playing this as white is to actually capture the pawn with the bishop. On the one hand, you don't get the uh, appealing fork, but on the other, the knight on g5 covers the pawn on e4, uh, which is significant. And also, the fact that you play bishop takes f7 with check means that uh, it will be your turn again if you are the, the white player after black moves his king. After bishop takes f7, black should go to e7 because he wants to keep the f8 square available for a rook uh, to move there to try and pressure along the semi-open f-file. So after king e7, here, uh, many strong white players have actually dropped the bishop to d5. But this is not what I think is the critical test. I think the natural move, and indeed the move that at the club level is most often played, is bishop back to b3 keeping the bishop, uh, preventing any kind of knight takes d5 possibilities. After bishop to b3, uh, we have to consider what can uh, black do. So for example, black could play h6, but here it's a very different story with the bishop on b3. Now white can actually jump into f7 and fork, and now with the king on e7, it cuts a lot of the possibilities of the black queen that in other lines was able to jump to e7. So this is actually um, really, really a bad situation for black. So because h6 is a losing move, uh, we have to consider other possibilities. Well, the main move is rook f8. Uh, another possibility perhaps is the move queen to e8 here instead of, uh, instead of rook f8. But after queen e8, white should play the move d3 and can hurry to play the plan that I'm going to recommend sort of throughout uh, this variation, which is basically play d3 as soon as you can, and then play your bishop to e3 and cut off this extremely strong dark squared bishop on c5 that is pressing this classically weak point on f2. And if you can do this, white can hope to um, basically uh, ward off the threats of attack and um, keep his extra pawn. So after d3, black uh, can continue with a move like d6, he would have nothing better, activating his bishop and creating threats like knight g4, bishop g4, uh, but now white is in time. He plays bishop to e3, the bishops come off the board, and now black has one idea left, which is queen g6. The point being that if white moves his knight, it seems that at least he will get the pawn on g2. However, it turns out that this is not a big deal, because white does indeed put his knight on f3, and if we capture this pawn on g2, then white has the move rook g1, and this pawn on g7 will fall. So as it turns out, in this position, taking the pawn on g2 is not a big deal at all. Um, therefore, black doesn't have that many options left. He could play a natural developing move like bishop d7 in order to get his rooks into play, but white counters similarly with a natural developing move. And now after the rook finally comes into play, black may have all of this, these intentions that he's going to attack um, on the king side with all of his pieces either on the king side directly or pointing towards the king side like this bishop on d7. But uh, here the last thing that you need to know from a white perspective is white can just place his queen somewhere like e2, defend g2, still keep an eye on f3, and plan to take his king to safety on the other um, corner of the board, so to speak. So on the other side there with queenside castling will solve all of white's problems. And at the end of the day, white is a good, clean central pawn to the good. So um, here, I really think that this is a, a lot of suffering for, um, for the black player uh, over the coming uh, moves in the middle game and end game. So. Uh, this is this particular line, so let's now uh, jump back. Um, 
Yeah, so we just took a look at this move uh, queen e8, after which we saw white is playing d3 and quickly exchanging the dark squared bishops. Now we're going to take a look at the move rook f8, which is the most popular move at both master and club level. After rook f8, once again, one thing to know about this position is if you castled kingside, then after uh, kingside castle, black would go d6. And if you now played the move pawn to d3, black would have this move bishop g4. And here, the fact that white spent time castling means he hasn't had the chance to put a bishop on e3. So this position is a little bit more um, difficult for white to play because, for example, if you play the move knight to f3, you're going to have your knight pinned and black is going to get a lot of play on the king side. You cannot play the move pawn to f3 because of um, the bishop on c5. And if you move the queen, then black could potentially attack this knight on g5. And where are you going to place it? If you drop it back to f3, black can take and force you to take back with a pawn. And then um, you might, as, as the white player, actually even be in trouble there. So therefore, I don't uh, recommend to castle too quickly. Instead, let's just drop the position back to here. So after the move uh, rook f8, here instead of uh, castling on the king side, you instead play the move pawn to d3 first. Now, uh, at this point, black can play d6, but white, rather than investing a move into castling, plays the bishop to e3, and once the bishop is on e3, uh, I think that uh, white's problems have more or less been solved, because if after the bishops are exchanged, white will probably put the queen on e2, knight on c3, castle queenside, the plan that we already saw, and white is in great shape. So after uh, the move bishop e3, for example, black could uh, exchange the bishops, bishop takes e3, f takes e3, queen e8, but again, the same idea as knight f3, queen to g6, let's say, queen to d2, defending the pawn, and again, after bishop d7, knight will come to c3, and white will uh, castle queenside. So more or less, this is the plan that I think the white player should be aiming for. Um, to quickly recap, the, keys, uh, the key points to remember is that you should capture the pawn on f7 with the bishop. And then once you've done that, there's a few concrete lines to look at. But the main uh, idea that I think really gives white a very good position is to delay castling kingside and instead focus on playing pawn to d3 and bishop to e3, challenging that uh, strong dark squared bishop, which is black's best piece. And then instead of castling kingside, most of the time, if you can get away with it, if you have the time, just clear the, uh, clear the way for uh, queenside castling instead, where white's king will be perfectly safe. As you can see in this position, on the next move, white is going to castle queenside, and we can see that uh, he has that healthy extra central pawn and black really does not have, um, I would say, almost any compensation for the pawn. And we also should keep in mind that black's king is not very safe here on e7. So I really think this is the big problem that faces Traxler counterattack players. And um, if you're playing the white side, then you should be very happy to get this possibility, this position on the board. So hope you enjoyed the coverage of the Traxler uh, counterattack. And um, I will see you in the next video where we'll continue our discussion of the many possibilities in the two knights defense. So see you then.